A kinetic energy recovery system stores energy during braking to later assist with acceleration, instead of wasting the energy as heat in the brakes. This is very similar to regenerative braking in electric and hybrid cars, but in some cases the energy can be stored in a flywheel. And if you're a subscriber of this channel, you'll know that I love flywheels. So let's build a bike with a flywheel kinetic energy recovery system. The plan is to use a bike that I previously made to be air powered from another video, as the frame is a simple tubular design and has lots of space for a flywheel. Plus I already have a CAD model of it, so that will save some design time. From this I can work out how large of a flywheel I'll need, which seems to be about a 30cm diameter. So where on earth do I get such a flywheel? I have a CNC router to cut parts for a lot of my projects, but I've never cut anything heavier than aluminium. Ideally the flywheel needs to be made from steel, as steel is three times denser than aluminium. Whilst browsing the internet for steel sheets, I found a bunch of sellers on eBay selling laser cut steel discs to the perfect dimensions I need, which saves me a ton of work. To turn this steel disc into a flywheel, I first measured and drilled some holes on a friend's drill press, but because I measured the hole positions by hand, they probably won't be perfectly aligned. So I positioned the flywheel at a distance from my camera and took a photo. I can then import this image into my CAD software and make a model of the flywheel, which shows the centre of the drilled holes to only be out by 0.086 of a millimetre, which was a pleasant surprise. Also, I can use this template to design some side plates that will correct for this small misalignment and allow the bearings to be mounted either side of the flywheel. The purpose of the disc brake will become clear later. The next step was to make the brackets that will hold the flywheel inside of the bike frame. These were cut from 6mm thick aluminium sheet which should provide plenty of strength to keep the flywheel from breaking loose at high RPM. It was then time to check if my measurements and design were correct by attaching everything to the bike. And there we have it, a flywheel on a bike. Now we need to figure out how to connect it to the rear wheel to capture the braking energy and assist with acceleration. In an ideal world, the bike wheel and the flywheel must be coupled together using an infinitely variable transmission. This would allow the bike to travel at a certain speed and the flywheel to be stationary. Then when the bike slows down, the flywheel will speed up to a really high RPM. The only problem is this is very difficult to do mechanically as you would basically need an infinitely variable gear ratio. So the next best solution is to use a clutch system that can engage and disengage the flywheel during braking and acceleration. This isn't an original idea and in fact a number of other people have built very similar bikes in the past and you can find their videos here on YouTube. However, I couldn't find much information on how effective their bikes were. So what do you do when you can't find any more information on a subject? You run the experiment yourself. To fit the clutch within the bike frame, I need to make this plate on my CNC, which took a while to cut and was pretty wasteful of material and memory card space. But it can be attached to another plate that has specially designed cutouts for mounting brake pads. This can then be positioned on the same shaft as the flywheel and press against the brake disc to act as a clutch. So not only are the bike parts cheap and easily available, but it's also a really compact clutch mechanism that easily fits within the bike frame. At regular cycling speeds, bike wheels don't spin much faster than about 300 RPM, but I need this flywheel to spin around 2000 RPM to store the energy required to get me going again. So there needs to be a large gear ratio between the bike wheel and the flywheel. This means the flywheel will spin in the opposite direction to the bike wheels, but I'm hoping that won't be an issue. So the clutch design kind of works, but it also sticks a lot. The clutch plate I cut earlier needs to be one piece to allow for this small gear to fit around the small bearings. However, my CNC router isn't very good at cutting perfectly round holes. So these thin wall bearings are slightly squeezed out of being circular, which makes them spin terribly and barely slide along the shaft, causing the clutch to get stuck. The solution to this was to increase the size of the gear and use a larger bearing, but this reduces the gear ratio to the rear wheel, so I had to make a larger rear sprocket to maintain the same ratio between the wheels. To engage the clutch, I 3D printed two discs with thread-like slopes, which when twisted, push each other apart. These needed to be really compact, as there's only about 6mm of space between the clutch gear and the side plate, but it seems to have a decent amount of pushing force due to the physics of mechanical advantage. I chose to operate the clutch using the left hand lever, like a motorbike, but this operates in reverse to a motorbike, as pulling the clutch lever actually engages the clutch, rather than disengaging it. The reason for this is I don't want the clutch engaged all of the time when riding, because it requires a lot of energy to spin up the flywheel, so pulling the lever in will add resistance and act as a brake.
Then when the bike is fully stopped, the flywheel will continue to spin with its stored energy, and I can simply pull the lever again to engage the clutch and bring the bike back up to speed. I think it's time for a test ride. I suppose I just ride like a normal bike. Wow, these gears are noisy. Right, so I'm gonna pick up some speed and then engage the clutch and see what happens. Slow me down. I engage the clutch again. Hang on, the clutch needs tightening. It's not fully gripping. Pick up the speed, pick up the speed. And then we engage the clutch. And now accelerate. I think we still need to adjust the clutch a tiny bit. It's not quite biting enough to fully lock. So let me get some tools. Ooh, that's a lot better. That slowed me down quite a lot, actually. Let's see if I can accelerate again. And... That's, that's not bad, it's not bad. I think what the problem is, is that by the time the clutch fully engages, it's already slowed me down by a substantial amount. So I'm gonna try and spin it up whilst pedaling. to get up to really high RPM. Okay, that's fast. Let's turn around and see that. <laughs> Let's analyze what's going on here. Imagine the two lines on the left display the relative speed of the bike and the flywheel. Whilst riding, the bike is at high speed and the flywheel isn't spinning. Then as I engage the clutch, the flywheel starts to spin and the bike slows down until the point where the flywheel has matched the speed of the clutch. From this point, the flywheel can't spin any faster and so they both continue at a constant speed until I use the regular bike brakes to bring the bike to a stop. Now the bike has zero speed, but the flywheel is spinning with roughly half the speed the bike had at the start. So when the clutch is re-engaged, the bike accelerates as the flywheel slows, and they both meet in the middle again once their speeds are matched. But if I bring the flywheel up to speed whilst riding, the flywheel can store a lot more energy as it's spinning much faster, and I can then use the regular bike brakes to bring the bike to a stop. Now we have a much larger speed difference between the bike and the flywheel, so when I engage the clutch, the end speed of the bike is a lot faster. So that's the problem, I can't charge it up just from braking, it has to charge up from riding. <laughs> Come on, get it going, get it going! <sighs> and then we fully stop, and then we accelerate. <laughs> Come on! High speed, high speed, high speed, high speed! <sighs> and... And that was a bit scary. <laughs> Had some tire weights mounted here. Two 10 gram tire weights and one just came off and hit me in the leg. Must be traveling at pretty high RPM for that thing to come off. Right, I found a tire weight. I think we need to go in and make a cup of tea. I love it. Okay, let's run through some of the numbers of this flywheel bike setup. The weight of the flywheel is about 5.5 kilograms and the fastest I got it spinning was 2,300 RPM. That's a stored energy of about 1,800 joules. 
To put that into perspective, a small AA battery stores about five to six times that amount of energy. However, you can't charge and discharge one of those batteries anywhere near as fast as you can this flywheel. So they have very different applications. In terms of the speed recovery achieved by the flywheel, the initial braking technique only recovered about 22% of the original speed of the bike. And the second technique of spinning up the flywheel before braking achieved a speed recovery of about 40%. But the act of having to pedal to spin up the flywheel beforehand requires a lot of effort. So that's where the extra energy comes from. Also, because energy increases with velocity squared, the actual energy efficiency never exceeds about 15%. But a few years ago, I ran some tests on my DIY electric bike and its regenerative braking. And during a straight line acceleration and deceleration test, its efficiency was only about 15.7%. So maybe flywheels aren't so bad after all. If you enjoyed this video, it'd be great if you could leave a thumbs up down below. If you're new to my channel and want to see other projects similar to this, then please click subscribe down below. And a massive thank you to all of my supporters over on patreon.com for making this project possible. I honestly couldn't make these crazy projects without your support. So thanks once again. Thanks once again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. Let's quickly test the gyroscopic effects of the flywheel. It actually doesn't seem too bad.